Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is 11 o'clock. It is time to get started. Uh, I understand there's still some people coming in. Uh, <clears throat> it's going to be okay when they come in. Just everybody look at them like they're late, all right? <clears throat> Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, dear Lord, for just giving us joy and laughter. Thank you, dear Lord, for giving us this beautiful sanctuary to come and worship you in. We pray, dear God, that you would just lift our spirits today, that you would encourage us. You would allow us, dear Lord, to appreciate your presence here and just open our minds and study the words that are, are presented before us and then lift our voices in praise as Miss Krista leads us in music. Amen. Miss Krista. All right, we are going to start with number 601, I'll Fly Away. Just don't fly away right now.
I'd like to welcome y'all this morning. We're so glad that you are here. We are a little light on the announcement. Summer is a little bit slow right now, but a couple things I do want to highlight. We will not be having a Wednesday night meal this Wednesday, but we are still having church service at 7 p.m., so please come back or join us for that. Six o'clock. No, Wednesday. Wednesday night, Miss Jill. Wednesday night, it's at 7 o'clock. Tonight, service is at 6, as usual, and we are still having choir practice at 5. So if you would like to join us on our um, special song for July 4th, please come and join us for choir practice. Um, other than that, I think everything else is normal. VBS is coming up if you want to help see Kylie. Um, at this point, we're going to, con oh no, we're going to do birthdays and anniversaries, and I'm ashamed, I almost forgot. We have one over here. Ah, lots of birthdays. You're forever young, right, Miss Clara? 295, all hail King Jesus, and we'll sing through He is Exalted and Majesty.
portion of our service is our new song, Oh Church Arise.
We're going to open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 6 today. Uh, the entire time we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 6. I'm not going to ask you to look at any other biblical references, although, although there are many uh, biblical references. If you've looked at the bulletin, you've seen that the title of the message is... <coughs> And I don't even know if everybody in here believes this or not. <laughs> and I'm going to attempt to, to stay in one section of Scripture and present the evidence for just that, that biblical statement. <clears throat> Title of the message is Why You Cannot Lose Your Salvation. Now, we're going to talk about works, and we're going to talk about grace, we're going to talk about faith, we're going to talk about how it was perceived in the Old Testament. And what this letter to the Hebrews was actually uh, intended to do. And, and, and this was intended to teach not, not a new message, but a continued message of God. And in this particular instance, uh, when we leave here today, some of you might be, well, I don't necessarily agree with you, Brother Claude, or I didn't like some of the references that you used. And that's okay. It really is. It's, it's perfectly permissible for you to be wrong. <laughs> that was humorous. I, I'm glad somebody laughed. Okay. Uh, we'll start in Hebrews chapter 6. We'll, we'll do verse 1. Uh, children's Church, Miss Jill. Sorry. She was looking at me like, are you going to do this or not? And I was like, you can go if you want, Ella. It's fun. Or you can stay in here with me. I'm more fun. I'm just happy she gave me sometimes. You guys are laughing like I got beat. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 6, really and truly Hebrews chapter 6, the first 10 verses that we're going to look at are not complete unless you also read Hebrews chapter 5. When, if you're going to go to Hebrews chapter 5, you should probably start in Hebrews chapter 1. So I really do believe that reading the entirety of the Word of God is something that he expects us to do because I don't think that he wrote it down for his benefit. I think he wrote it down for our benefit. So if you've not completely read all of the book of Hebrews, I would encourage you to do that. If you've not completely read the entire book of the Bible, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, really and truly, this is something that can be completed in just a 40-hour work week. If you just sat down and said, I'm going to spend eight hours a day reading the Bible, you'd be finished in a week. You really could. Uh, before we begin with the reading of, of the Holy Word, I'm going to ask uh, <clears throat> Brother James Smith, would you mind saying a prayer for our service, sir? Lord Jesus, Father, we come before you, we humble ourselves, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, your loving kindness, and for Father, I pray over Brother Carl, Lord Jesus, please fill him with the Holy Spirit that he might preach your word, that he might preach it in truth, Father. Lord, let us open our hearts and our minds and receive it, and let us share it with the lost and dying world. Father, forgive us of our sins. In the holy name, amen. 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 Thank you, Brother James. Okay, so we're going to begin reading in Hebrews chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 1. <clears throat> Verse 1 and 2 really go together. Uh, when we get to verses, uh, that's going to be so hard. All right, we're going we're gonna to go through this as best we can. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. So we're not even finished with verse 1 yet. So in this particular instance, I want you to understand that this letter... Many believe it was written by the Apostle Paul to the, the Hebrew people in the church there. So in, in this particular instance, what we're saying is he's actually giving them a commandment. And he says, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. So this is it. He says, okay, we're going to stop talking about the elementary principles of Christ. Now, here's the problem with that. Some of you guys, you came into the Christian faith. You walked the aisle. You were baptized. And then you stopped. That was where you stopped. And in this particular instance, this letter is, is intending to let us know that that's not where we actually stop. That this is, that salvation is a lifelong process. It is a lifelong process. And this is where I'm going to start to get myself in trouble. And I might as well do it in verse 1. Because some people have the wrong impression of what salvation is. Salvation is a gift of God through the grace of God that we accept or that we reject based on the faith that he has given us. And if we accept that grace, then we have received salvation. But some people get this confused. Salvation is not perfection. When you leave here, you're leaving here the same person basically that you were when you walked in. You have a lifetime of experience of doing things wrong. When you leave here after you have experienced salvation, you are saved, but you are not perfect. There's a difference. 
It really is. And in, in, in this particular instance, it messes up the way we operate church. It really does. Because some people will say, okay, if a young person comes to be baptized, then do they really understand what it is they're getting into? No, they don't. Let's be honest, none of you did. I didn't. Salvation does not mark perfection, ladies and gentlemen. Salvation is one of those things that is a gift of God. I'm going to get ahead of myself. It is. It's a gift of God. It's grace. We're saved by grace, through faith, unto good works. There's the whole message right there. You could leave now. <laughs> you can't, because you've got to wait on the van. <clears throat> Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ should, as a Christian, encourage you that, you know what? It's not just the basics he's about to reveal here. He wants us to go deeper. He wants us to have an understanding of the character of God. And he's telling us in verse 1, okay, stop focusing on the basics. Let's get a little deeper. Continuing in verse 1. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Now, this is really key here, ladies and gentlemen, because in the Old Testament, so in the Old Testament, people believed that they were saved by the law. So what he's saying here in the New Testament is that that understanding that the law can save you doesn't work. Your obedience to the law because it is the law is dead work. The, the works that you do, the best work that you could ever do is going to fall short of the grace of Jesus Christ. And that best work does not get you into heaven. So he's trying to teach an entire culture of people that understand that if they want to be in heaven, then what they have to do is they have to do what the law says. They have to be good people. And we still get that confused in the modern church today because when I go out and I visit with people and I ask them, hey, can you come to church? And they'll say things like, well, there's, some, there's a few things I need to get right first. Dead works. You can't get right enough to earn grace. Grace is a free gift. So if you're trying to get right, then what you are doing is you're focusing on dead works. And we know that it's dead works because he tells us here in Hebrews chapter 6, we're just in verse 1. Laying aside the foundation of repentance from dead works. That's where you, that's, man, we still go there today. Oh, I did something wrong. I have to go out and do something good. Doing something good does not overcome the evil that you have already created in the world. Jesus Christ overcomes the evil that you created in the world. Doing something good can be nice. It can be. The other person might appreciate it, but if you're counting on doing something good in order to earn you favor with God, then you have a misunderstanding of what it is to be a child of God. You are a child of God through grace. He created you. He loves you. He died for you before you ever even made your first mistake. That's how he loves you. Verse 2. Of the doctrine of baptisms. I'm going to stop right there for just a second. How many baptisms are there? It's plural in Scripture, right? Somebody have a King James Version of the Bible? We're in Hebrews chapter 6. We're in verse 2. Is there an S on the end of the word baptism for you? No, yes, no, yes, okay. <laughs> Washings. That's what I was about to get to, Scott. So thank you very much for just stealing my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> the doctrines of baptisms in this particular instance is actually making a reference to an Old Testament practice where they would actually wash as a sign of an outward cleansing of the inward nature of their heart. So in this particular instance, yes, they use the word baptism, but they're talking about washings. And what they're, they're talking about is spiritual washings where you've done something wrong, and so you're going to go down to the river, and you're going to wash the sin away, and you're going to do it in a public manner because you want people to know that you have repented and you're doing something good, and because you're doing something good, then you get to go to heaven. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is not a dead philosophy in our world today. People still believe that if I'm going to be to heaven. If I'm going to get to heaven, I have to be good. You don't get to heaven by being good. You get to heaven through the grace of Jesus Christ. Now, through that salvation, 
We are actually saved unto good works. So then, yes, we go out and we do good things, but we're doing good things because we have partaken of the glorious nature of God and he inspires us. He motivates us. He will not allow us to sit around and just do nothing because we can look out into a lost and dying world and we can see that people are sinning and they're on the way to hell and we don't want them to go to hell. So we go out and we try and encourage them. We try and motivate them. We try and do something that's good, but we're not doing it because that makes us better. It does. We're still terrible, awful, wretched sinners saved by the grace of God. Amen? We don't ever have the ability to look down upon a sinner because we would only be able to look up because whew, we're sinners too. So when he's talking about this washing here, he's saying, hey, look, that, that practice of washing away your sin in a public way, that's not what salvation is about. That's not what you were saved unto. You, you were not spared from the, the pits of hell so you can make other people think they're not as good as you are. The laying on of hands. The laying on of hands is a, sp a spiritual reference to a sacrifice. When the sacrifice would be brought to the temple, the people would actually lay their hands on the sacrifice and give it over. And in that instance, they're giving over their sin. So the laying on of hands, it's, it's a tradition that the church had. It's a tradition that, that the people who are reading this letter that was probably written by Paul, that most people will say, most people agree it was written by Paul. Some are like, no, I don't think so. And I don't think you guys care about that at all, so it doesn't matter. I might not mention it ever again. It's in the Word of God. <laughs> the laying on of hands... And the resurrection of the dead. Now, the resurrection of the dead was also very hard for the Pharisees because they sort of believed in the resurrection of the dead, but then they also were the ones, if you think about it, that's who Paul was before he was saved, is he was one of those people that questioned the resurrection of the dead in reference to how it played out in reality. So he, remember, he says, we're not going to talk about the basics. We're going to move on to greater things. And then he lists all of these things, and you're asking, are these the greater things that he's talking about, or are these the lesser things that he's talking about? And I'm here to tell you today that he's talking about the lesser things right now. He's listing out all of the things that people used to argue about, and the problem with that is some of those things that are on this list from 2,000 years ago, we still argue about today. We still believe these lies. We still believe that this is the way unto heaven. And we forget that this is not the way because you don't get there through the law. You don't get there through being good. You get there through the sacrifice of Jesus. The sacrifice of Jesus is what is taking care to ensure your salvation. There's nothing you can do to earn it. There's not. And if we could not get past that 2,000 years ago... Why are we still worried about it today? Because the devil is real. <laughs> because the devil understood, hey, I have the people distracted. All I have to do is just continue to tell them this story, and they'll continue to argue about it. And as long as they're arguing about it, guess what they're not doing? You're not doing anything good. You're not. You're not going to argue anybody into heaven. You can't. You can't drag them into heaven as much as you might want to. As much as you might love that person, you cannot pick them up, bind them, and carry them into heaven. It is a free will choice that was offered to us through the grace of God. I hadn't got to point one yet. I'm still on verse two. This is going to be a long day. Verse three. And this we will do if God permits. Verse 3, highlight that one, underline that one, put an asterisk next to it in your Bible. And this we will do if God permits. What are we doing? We're not paying attention to the lesser things. Why? Because God is going to bless us to grow spiritually onto greater things. What is that first greater thing? Point number one. Salvation is a gift of God. A gift. Now we're going to talk about this. The title of the message was Why You Cannot Lose Your Salvation. This is point number one on why you cannot lose your salvation. God gives it to you. God gives salvation. It is through the grace of God that you receive salvation. Through the faith that he has instilled in us. So in this particular instance, God is going to give you something. And if God gives you something, who has the ability to take something away from God? Nobody. 
So if you have received salvation as a gift from God, is God going to allow someone to steal that salvation from you? How can you explain in your mind or in the modern world that you can receive a gift from God, but then you just lost it? But you know, dear Lord, I really appreciate all those things that you've given me. I just don't know where I put them. God's not going to give you something that you have the ability to walk away from. God's going to give you something that is a gift of God. And, and I don't know how I can express that in a greater context than, than just this. He is the king of everything, the creator of everything, the assigner of everything. And when he gives something to you, it's yours. It's yours. There are other places in Scripture I could point to, but I'm going to try and stay in Hebrews chapter 6 where God says that no one can pluck you from his hand. He is God. So if you have received salvation by grace, through faith, unto good works, you do not lose your salvation. Now some of you are going to say, but Brother Claude, do you know so-and-so? Yes, I do. I'm intimately familiar with so-and-so. And you know so-and-so, he's still out doing this and he's still out doing that. Absolutely. But he says he's saved. I'm like, so what? He tells you all kinds of things. Why do you only believe that one? <laughs> See, there's a, there's a fine line here between a said salvation and a received salvation. This is where it starts to get a little bit messy. And this is where we'll start to argue. But I'm not trying to argue. I'm trying to go through those greater things. Remember, we're not going to talk about the base things. We're going to move on to something better. So if God gives us salvation, then we have received salvation of God. Then that salvation that we have received is now inside of us. It's part of us. It changes us. It creates in us new life. It creates in us a desire to know more than just the basic things. We want to know more about God. It generates inside of us a will to be more and more like Christ and not that will where we're more and more like the world. There is a change that takes place when you receive salvation and that change should be evident by your life. So if you are not living a life that is evident of salvation, then I'm of the opinion you were never saved in the first place. I don't care what you say, you've been wrong before. Amen? You guys are just not as excited about this as I am. See, I want us to leave here today with a clear understanding that salvation is a gift of God. Through the death, and burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it is secured unto us. And if it is secured unto us and it is a gift of God, then I don't have the ability to misplace it. And you say, well, Brother Claude, what if they just turn their back on it? Like they know they have it, but they don't pay any attention to it. We're going to get to that in Scripture in just a second, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you a preview. Just because a person says they were saved doesn't mean they were. If a person has no evidence of salvation in their life, then they still need salvation. It's not that they're backslidden and they need to repent and come back to, to the Lord. That's that baser thing. That's that washing. That's that baptism. That's that spiritual practice from thousands of years ago that we're being told is not sufficient to get us unto heaven, that salvation is a gift of God. And through that grace, we are saved forever and ever and ever and ever. And once that grace is inside of you, woohoo! you get excited about it. It's not just that, oh man, it's Sunday morning. It's like, woohoo! it's Sunday morning. It's like, I get to go to church today. What are you going to do in church? I don't know, but I'm going to meet Jesus there. Who's going to sing? I don't know. Who's going to teach Sunday school? I don't know. Why are you going? Because God gave me a gift and it grows inside of me and I long to be with him. And because I long to be with him, then I love his people and his people show up. So I show up. Why do you do that? Because God created me to be this person I am, not that person that I was last week, not the person that you knew in high school, not the person that used to run around and do all of those things that we weren't supposed to do. That's not who I am. That's who I was. Like, well, doesn't this sound fun to go and do such and such? Nope. Don't you remember? Yeah, I remember. What do you remember? I remember being miserable before I found God. I remember being angry. I remember having fits of rage. I remember thinking that the entire world was just unfair. Think about that for a second. That's not adolescence I'm talking about. That's being lost. 
That's not having salvation in my heart and knowing that I have a secure Father in heaven who loves me. That, that's not knowing that I have an eternal home being built by the hands of Jesus Christ in the heavenlies above that I can look forward to going to. I was stuck in this world and I was looking around and this world is just a terrible, awful, wretched place and I just didn't want to be here anymore. And then I was saved. And all of a sudden, I began to see the beauty of this world, the creations that God has blessed us with. The peace that comes from knowing that the devil doesn't have any control over my life anymore. The ability that I now have to say, nope, in the strength of God, I shall not do that. Not in my own personal strength. I, I don't have the own personal strength to stop myself from falling into sin or temptation. I don't. I have to focus my life on the things that God has created me to do. And if I'm focusing on that thing that God has already given me and the glory that grows inside of me, then I get excited about doing something for the glory of God. See, if I start talking about going on door-to-door -door visitation, some of you are like, oh, I have to walk. I'm like, no, we get to meet people. We have to knock on doors. Yes, we get to see beautiful homes. What if the dog bites me? We get to meet dogs too. <laughs> See, it's the perception that changes inside of you when the salvation is received. It's not that the world has changed. The world is still an awful, terrible, wretched place. It is, but I have hope. Why do I have hope? Because I invited God into my heart, and he said, here I am. And I haven't been the same since. Because you're not the same when you receive Christ. Because the Holy Spirit begins to indwell your body, and he begins to change you from the inside. And this is where we still get confused. We're like, well, so-and-so, they came forward, and they professed faith, and then they were baptized, and then I saw them out drinking, or I saw them out smoking, or I saw them out carousing. I'm like, yep. Whoa. What does that mean? They're human. Amen. <laughs> They're human. That's it. Well, are they going to go to hell? It's like, that's not my choice. God didn't put me on that committee. That's a decision that God is working on that particular person for. But if you can see that they're out doing these things and they're wrong, and he's put that on your heart, that you're worried about their salvation, then maybe you should go and speak to them. Oh, no, I couldn't do that, Brother Claude. Why not? Well, they might think that I'm, I'm just gossiping. Well, you are. Yeah. Somebody's toes, right? Tim Brandon, that was for you, Bubba. He's watching on YouTube, and he can't say anything now. Usually he's sitting over there and interrupt the service, but now he just has to watch. You still, still got me, though. Tim, you have to show up to disturb service. I'm sorry. Or you have to wait for Hannah. <laughs> yeah, it's just going to be okay. All right, so we're on point number one, and we're on verse four. <laughs> we're still in Hebrews chapter six. Let's go to verse four because it gets more specific. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift, and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Really pay attention to verse 4. This is the word of God. And what does it say? For it is impossible. And then it describes what? A person who's saved. Someone who is enlightened. They have tasted the heavenly gift, and they have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. How do you become a partaker of the Holy Spirit? You invite him in. God is a noble and just God. He doesn't go anywhere he's not wanted. He waits for you to open the door so he can come in. And once you've opened the door and he comes in, boom, you're changed. How do I know that? Verse 4, for it is impossible for someone who is saved, continuing in verse 5, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Oh, that's still the good stuff. Oh, we're still the good stuff. Verse 6. If they fall away, to renew them again to repentance. It's impossible for someone who falls away to be renewed unto repentance. That's what the Word of God says. That's not, not me standing up here telling you this is what I think. We just read this out of the Word of God. It's in Hebrews chapter 6. We just read verses 4 and 5. It's impossible for someone who has invited the Holy Spirit into their lives, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance. What does that say? It's impossible to lose your salvation. Once it's yours, it's a gift of God, and no one can pluck you out of his hand. So if you are truly saved, then you are saved indeed. If you had a said faith, and you're like, you know what, I think I'd like to walk the aisle. I think I'd like to do it right. But I think I'd also like to go out and do all of those other things. 
Scripture says you can't serve two gods. Pick one. I recommend the one who spoke and the world leapt into existence because the other one is no God at all. And then it goes on to be very specific. It says, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God. Now, but Jesus said it was finished on the cross. So if it's finished on the cross, what is he saying? He's saying, I ain't getting back up there. Keep it basic. Keep it simple. Jesus said, I was already crucified once. Just because you think you fell away, I need to be crucified again. It ain't going to work like that. He's spelling it out for us, ladies and gentlemen, that his death on the cross for our atonement was once and for all. That he's not going to do it again and again and again. And you keep saying, but Brother Claude, what if I sin? God understands that salvation does not mean perfection, but he also gives you an entire lifetime to work towards his greater glory. So if you're doing something that is wrong and you know you're doing something wrong, stop doing it. How do I do that? It's pretty simple. Oh, it's so simple. Don't do it. Don't do it. But Brother Claude, I'm tempted. We all are. Not a person in this room that does not face temptation in some context almost on a daily basis. If you have figured out some way that you have not been tempted on a daily basis, what I want you to understand is that staying at home alone and not turning on the TV and not looking at your phone is not a productive life for the, for the glory of God. <clears throat> if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, remember it was impossible if they fall away to renew them again. So what does that mean? You don't fall away. You don't. Well, Brother Claude, what if they're out living their life? However they choose to live their life. What I'm telling you is they were not saved. That's what I'm telling you. If they're living their life as, is there, as if there is no God, then they were never introduced to God in the first place because that's what the book of Hebrews tells us. Verse number 7. Wait, I think I got verse... Yep, verse 7. <clears throat> For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs usefully for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessings from God. Now, there's a spiritual application here because we're just talking about it being impossible to fall away and then to renew to repentance. <clears throat> and then he starts talking about herbs. So you have to read verse 8 along with verse 7. So the earth drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated. If you're cultivating the herbs, you can find some use. Continuing in verse 8. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. Verse 7 and verse 8 are explaining to us our choices, ladies and gentlemen. The rain comes and God provides. If we cultivate it, then we receive the blessings. If we don't, if we're the thorns and the briars, then we are about to be rejected and burned. He didn't start a new thought here. He's trying to explain to us how simple it is. The rain falls, and you have no control over it. It falls or doesn't fall. What you can do is you can cultivate the soil, and you can prepare for the rain to fall, and you can grow something that, that is herbs, that is good, that is useful, and you can receive the blessings from it. Or you can choose to go the other way with this and pay no attention to the fact that God is giving you an opportunity to receive a blessing when it rains, and you just meander around and do whatever it is you want, however it is you want, whenever it is you want, wherever it is you want. And you're near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. Point number two. If you could never have had salvation, you can't lose it. And that's what I'm telling you is happening to those people who you want to say, oh no, they were saved. They used to go to church regular. They used to teach Sunday school. They were a youth pastor. And now they're not. They don't go to church and they're in prison. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, that salvation is such a powerful gift of God that when you receive it, 
your life changes forever. Forever. And then you will live a life that will show evidence of that salvation. Some of you in this particular room, man, you guys do such a wonderful job. You really do. You, you, you show up, you volunteer, you check on people when they're sick, you, you visited Miss Linda, you brought her chocolate milkshakes and chocolate cake and chocolate oatmeal peanut butter things. Sorry, no baked cookies. Is that what they're called, Kylie? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Some of you do an excellent job of those things. You really do. And some of you don't. And I, I want you to see here that in Hebrews chapter 6, God is actually spelling out for us the evidence of our salvation is a glorious transformation of the person who we were to the person who we are to become. It is a lifelong process. It doesn't stop until he calls you home, ladies and gentlemen. Verse number nine. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes. Now he's talking to the church. He's talking to us. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes. Things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. Keep in mind those first eight verses. He was trying to tell us a very real truth. We don't need to argue about the basics. You've been saved. Now you need to grow. Part of growth is understanding that some of the things that we used to believe, well, they were just wrong. Because they were. But he says, but beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. But for you, there are better things. Not just those things that you used to do. Not just that person you used to be. Not just that get over plan that you had to make it successful in this world and you were just going to take over and everything was going to be just fine. He says, no, but for you, there are better things. Things that accompany salvation. It's verse 9, so I'm like curious, what's verse 10 going to say? What better things is he talking about? For God. Better thing for us is God. See, that's the difference between the saved and the lost. It really is. A person who is saved understands that how they operate makes a direct reflection upon God. A person who is lost will live their life however they choose to live their life, having no care or concern or compassion for God whatsoever. For God is not unjust to forget your works. Now, wait a minute. In that first verse, he was telling us that the, the works were dead. But now he's saying, but for God is not unjust to forget your works and the labor of love which you had shown towards his name. Aha! There's a difference. There is, ladies and gentlemen, there's a difference to be saved unto good works and to count on good works for salvation. There's an incredible difference here. See, if we are doing good works... Because we are saved, then we're doing it for the glory of God. But if you can think back to that time before you were saved, and you thought, oh, somebody caught me doing something bad. i got to go do something good to balance this out. You weren't doing it for God. You were doing it for yourself. You were doing something good because you wanted to look a certain way for a certain person. That's dead. For God is not unjust to forget your works and labor of love which you have shown towards his name. And that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Yes. Now, this is a call for the church here. This last part, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. What is he telling us? He's saying, you've been saved. You've tasted of the glory of God. And it will generate inside of you a desire to minister. It generates a desire inside of you, a compassion for the lost because they need to be ministered to. But not just for the lost because it also says you have ministered to the saints. Who is that? That's us. That's those of us who are here today for the glory of God. We came into his house for his glory. He calls us saints because we have received that salvation that leads us through faith unto good works. And that now we are supposed to, it says, and do minister. 
That's why I love this part. <laughs> you don't get to quit. You don't get to retire. It's terrible for a preacher to say, I have no retirement plan. What is it? Dying. <laughs> it's not much of a plan. I'm pretty certain and it is. <laughs> I'm pretty certain it's going to happen. And I'm dang sure that when it does happen, I'm going to heaven and everything's taken care of there. So I'm not planning and preparing for that. I'm trying to do ministry unto those who have not yet received salvation. So as a church, ladies and gentlemen, are we doing ministry unto the lost? Are we reaching out? Like, well, we're here, Claude. Yep, we're here. We're here on Sunday morning. We're here on Sunday night. We're here on Wednesday night. You know what the lost thinks about that? Whew, I'm glad I'm not there with them. That's what they think. And we're supposed to minister unto that. They're not looking for us because, ladies and gentlemen, they're not thinking about God. How do I know? Because I didn't. And neither did you. But now, at this point in our lives, if we're going to say that, yes, we are saved, then you understand that that salvation is a gift of God and nobody can take it away from you and it changes you from the inside out and we're required to do ministry. Then we get to point three. Service. How do you know if a person is saved or not? What are they doing for the greater glory of God? If they're doing nothing for the greater glory of God, they have no fruit, they have no signs of service, then you should, ladies and gentlemen, be concerned about their salvation. Well, Brother Claude, well, that includes so-and-so. Yes, it does. Brother Claude, that's a really good person. No, it's not. That's a lost person. There is no good without God. And if they knew God, they would be here with us. It's a few empty seats. I think there's a few people out there that don't know God. I'm going to pray, and Miss Christ is going to come, and she's going to lead us in an altar call. What's the song? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. We're going to stand, and we're going to sing. The altar is open. Brother Virgil, if you'd come to the altar, if you'd like to come and request prayer, Brother Virgil is here for you. If you'd like to come and just have silent prayer, you have the entirety of this song. If you need longer than that, you just keep staying here, and we'll keep playing music. Don't miss your opportunity to accept the salvation that God wants to deliver and he's just waiting on you to open the door.
Miss Charlotte, I've never asked you before. Would you mind closing us in a word of prayer? Oh, hold on. Can I ask for a special yes, ma'am. My daughter-in-law's sister had her baby last night, early, about nine weeks early. She weighs four pounds and 13 ounces. She's doing okay. She's in NICU. Okay. But just pray that she continues to do well and turns out strong and healthy. Yes, ma'am. What's the baby's name? Vivian Blair. Vivian Blair. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ms. Charlotte, are you okay closing us in a word of prayer?